why should you have kids? Now, you've already brought up be fruitful and multiply. And I think people need to understand that that was not just something that God said to Adam and later to Noah to fill the earth with people because the earth needed people. It was fill the earth and subdue it. And you see later in Israel's history, God blessing Israel with fruitfulness, with uh, multiplying them. It empowers them to overcome their enemies because their strength in numbers. It's in that way, it is still an imperative for today. Now, of course, as the New Testament church, we also recognize that there is an adoptive element to that in which we can be fruitful and multiplied by evangelizing and winning souls for Christ. But just remember that when it comes to childbearing and our society has... Uh, so let me, let, me be, let me be clear on what I think you're saying. You're yeah. basically saying that if we have large families and we raise them the way God intended, that we are expanding the kingdom of God and making the kingdom of God a more powerful force in our world so that we might overcome the evil that's in the world. Is that is that a good summary of what you're saying? Yeah, I would say so. And that might so sound a little bit um, like uh, jihad to some people. <laughs> but just listen to this passage. Behold, this is Psalm 127. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Which, by the way, that word youth is used at a time when people did not live to be 100 years old. That is to say, I don't think that the author is imagining someone who's 35 years old mm -hmm. when they say youth. Right. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And frankly, I don't know what people do today when they read this passage. I mean, to me, this passage is, it has so much to say to us, but I think people just read it and even Christians kind of regard it they as just, they, archaic. They read it and they just say, well, kids are a good thing, and they leave it right there. Right, right. You can have them or not have them. One, two, three. Exactly. And when you consider who are our enemies today, because we have enemies, you know, make no mistake. Who are our enemies today? What, is, what has it been like when we have spoken with them at the gate? Are we winning? Anyway, this sounds a little bit radical. Children not only are a blessing, which they, they are, and we'll get to that in a second, but they are... They afford power not in the selfish sense, but in the spiritual sense to the parent and to the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? The kingdom mm -hmm. of God. Well, the whole thing that we, we need to understand, we need to look at these things from a spiritual perspective. You know, as I said at the, at the onset, we tend to just think, oh, well, I don't have kids because, you know, it's all about me and I want to have kids. Yeah. There's another reason to have kids. There's a reason that God gave the, us the imperative. And, you know, people can think it sounds radical or <laughs> sounds like we're, you know, advocating to let's build a, a, uh, a, an army by just having a bunch of kids. Well, that's kind of what we're, <laughs> kind of what we're advocating. You know, we didn't say be fruitful and multiply. That's not us. If you don't like that, don't look at me and say, mm. Scotty, you're, 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 you know, advocate. I'm, I'm just telling you what the word of God says. Yeah. And so, you know, what I would strongly encourage you, if you do not think that having many kids is a, a, the spiritual direction uh, that God has for you, look in the scriptures. Don't get in your own head and say, well, one's all I can handle or two's all I can handle or, you know, that's all I can afford. 
look at the scriptures. We're talking about living out the word, not living out Scotty's opinion, not living out Andrew's opinion, not living out what's convenient, not living out what I can think I can afford, what I've rationalized Hmm. in my own mind. What does the word of God say? You know, that should be our guide. And I'll just say it right from the outset. We had three kids. We wish we had had a lot more. I was not, I did not understand everything uh, back then that I understand now Mm. about what the scripture says about kids and how I should feel about my kids and some of the things that we're talking about today. So if if I had a do-over, we would have more, even Mm. though it was very difficult on Jonah from a childbirth standpoint, and that's really the reason that we stopped. you know, and, and if she were here, she would agree with me on mm-hmm. this. We, we would have had more. Uh, so anyway, again, just ground your decisions in the word. And please don't be offended by what I say. But if you're offended by what the word says, then take that to heart and try to bring your life into alignment with that. Don't just, you know, throw out the word of God because you don't like what it says. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, you know, I just read one verse there, Mm -hmm. but we could spend the rest of this podcast going through verses that indicate that fruitfulness is a blessing. I mean, I could, I could pull up probably 25 or 30 of them right now. Of course, you can also see it reflected in the accounts of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, even uh, Manoah. And his wife, who gave birth to Solomon, the the fertility, which is granted by God, we know that God opens and closes the womb, is an indication of the promise. It's an indication of the promise of God in the lives of the patriarchs and in the lives of the Israelites. In general, it's never the other way around. So as you read the Bible, keep your eyes open for that and, and consider what it means for your life. I want to just hit on something. This is not, again, we're, we're going off script. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit, and I don't want to go down a big rabbit hole here, but I do want you to at least challenge our listeners with the idea of birth control inside of marriage. Uh, I know... Uh, you are opposed to that. I, I'll I'll speak for you on that. Uh, you can you can uh, I'll let you speak for yourself. But that's that's I believe that's your position. And so <clears throat> I know you've done a, a lot of study on that. And what I'm going I'm gonna let you just give a brief snippet on it. But what I want to implore the listener to do is don't make an assumption on this topic. Uh, you know, I will be transparent and say, you know, I'm still on the fence on the topic myself. Andrew and I have discussed it quite a bit. I'm not advocating for a, a position one way or the other. What I am advocating is that you study the scripture. You look into the scripture and see what God is telling you on it. And don't go into it with a preconceived idea. So with that, what what is your position? And maybe you can just give us a, a brief <laughs> try, to, try to be brief because I, I know we could talk about this the rest of the podcast as well. Okay, we've already hit on the most important thing, which is that children are a gift from God. And to deliberately restrict procreation is essentially to say to God, thanks, but no thanks. And I would say if God is offering you a gift, it would be very unwise to reject that gift. So think about what you're saying to God by doing that. There's only one instance that I can think of in scripture where procreation is deliberately restricted in the sexual act. And that is uh, Onan and Tamar. The Bible describes him spilling his seed on the ground so that uh, uh, that Tamar would not reproduce. Now, uh, that's not a scripture to hang your hat on because, which by the way, he was uh, put to death for that. The question is, 
why was he put to death? Was it because of his dishonor of his deceased brother who he was standing in for? Or was it because he wasted his seed? Either way, the point is he did that. It's the only example that we have, and God did not look favorably upon that. Of course, the Bible also talks about ripping open pregnant women, which that's more along the lines of abortion than it is merely birth control. That is regarded as either a great evil done by an evil people or a great judgment on an evil people. It's a horrible thing. Then the question is, birth control, has it been good for our society? Well, we have already said that birth control ushered in the sexual revolution. What birth control did was remove the lifelong consequences from sex. It allowed people to treat sex as casual. And let me tell you, sex is not casual. And if you think that it is casual, which a lot of people do these days, you're badly mistaken and you're headed down a path that ends in brokenness. Now, I think this has really far reaching implications for our society. Now people can control if they have kids or not. What does that mean? People can have sex without consequences. What does that mean? People have sex without having to bind themselves to their partner. What does that mean? People have sex before marriage. What does that mean? People have, people get married later in life. Okay. What does that mean? That means they have fewer kids. It means they have kids when they're older, both of which predict overprotection, which if you want to read about overprotection, you should read The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt to really get a grasp on what implications that has for our culture, this helicopter parenting that has become more and more common. Also, have you noticed that there are a bunch of wimps running around to this world? <laughs> a bunch of, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of uh, wet, wet sandwich kind of men. Like what happened to the, the manly men? You know, why do we have all these pansies? When women are on birth control, it impacts their hormones such that at least over a certain span of time, they are not attracted to the indicators of high testosterone, meaning that women are no longer as attracted to manly men as they used to be. They're more attracted to girly men. So... <laughs> If you're upset about the girly men epidemic, I believe at least some of that can also be laid at the feet of birth control. I think I'll stop there. I don't think it's been good for our society at all. I don't think it's consistent with the testimony of scripture. And it makes me sad that so many, including so many Christians are utilizing it usually for selfish reasons.